Three. Hello and welcome back to Mixing Music. I'm your host DK and today you read the title, you know what it's about. I have with me the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Brian Hood. How you doing? Oh, hello. That's that's the best intro I've ever had on a podcast. You're like you're like hype man that hypes hype men. <laughs> Because I'm always the guy that hypes my co-host on my podcast, so I feel like I'm finally hyped. I love this. That is awesome. So if you guys don't know, Brian Hood, not only was he signed to a band with a band at a label at a very young age, but eventually, and now he's a full-time mix engineer, business owner, entrepreneur, extraordinaire, Um, and Brian Hood... Uh, has been involved and is part of the Six Figure Home Studio podcast and the courses online, um, as well as came out with a new product called File Pass, which we will talk about later. Mm -hmm. But today we want to talk about the 80-20 principle and how that applies to your business as a mix engineer. Now, the one thing that Brian and I, we were talking about, Uh, We were talking about how most of the time musicians and music business owners, we all are very creative with what we do with our craft, but sometimes we forget to be creative and where it matters, which is business. As mix engineers, most of the time we are running our own businesses. It is our own name, our own brand. Um, And one thing that Brian is very good at is building that brand, sharing it, getting hype around a brand and getting people to want to work with him. Isn't that right? I, I try my best. I'm not quite the hype man that you are, but, you know, I try. Dude, this will be a fun episode because Brian is also super smart and well-versed, loves to loves to read, like, is a total learner, so yeah, book nerd. I think that he has a lot of sh- knowledge to throw down on us. So today, we're going to be referencing a show from Six Figure Home Studio. I believe it was episode number 45, is that right? That's right. Episode 45, the episode title, if you're on an app that doesn't have the episode titles, uh, it's... About halfway through, because we're at episode 100 right now, so look halfway through the episodes. How to how studio owners are multiplying their income and minimizing their headaches using the 80-20 principle. So the 80-20 principles. What is the 80-20 principle, Brian? So one of the uh, one of the first business books I ever read back in like 2014, when like kind of had that entrepreneur spark that was lit inside my soul, where I was like, oh god, I have to have my own business. I have to take control of what I'm doing. Uh, everyone recommended, it seemed like the, the biggest recommended book at the time was The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss, the yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's like that's like the Bible for business for anyone that started a business back in like 2010 or around the time that book came out. And it still holds, holds, holds up pretty well today considering the fact that it's like a 10-year-old plus book. Anyways, there's a section in that book that introduces the 80-20 principle in a very uh, easy to understand way. And I've taken that to heart through my, through my career since then. So 2014 was the first year in my business, in my, my, uh, it was a full service recording studio actually in 2014. I have a studio called four, five, six recordings where I, my niche was heavy metal. And I don't know what kind of music most of your listeners do, but I, I would imagine it's probably not heavy metal, but, <laughs> but the good, the good thing is if I can make it in heavy metal, you can make it in whatever genre you're doing because heavy metal <laughs> is not a huge genre. Anyway. So I started implementing something called the 80, 20 principle. And before I get into what I did and how it helped, and how it can help you. Um, let me just tell you what the 80-20 principle is, a quick overview. 80-20 principle is this principle that says 80% of the results will come from 20% of the efforts. And there's, there's other ways to spin that, but that's the, essential, uh, that's the essential way to understand it as far as business. So to put it a few other ways, uh, in mixing, 20% of your mix decisions will result in 80% of the overall mix. And... Mm. The 80% after that that you do to your mix, all the little tweaks and all the little knobs and all the little things you do and the, th- the EQs you add and take off, that only tweaks the mix the final 20%. And so if you can focus on improving that early 20% that gives you 80% of the results, you're going to have a much, much easier time to mix. That principle also applies to your business. If you're a mixing engineer, you need customers. And if you need customers, you need to understand how to market your studio. And marketing applies the same principle, the 80-20 principle. 20% of your marketing efforts will give you 80% of the results. And this is liberating for a few reasons. First of all, in mixing, whether it's mixing or marketing or finance or budgeting or anything else in the world, as long as you understand the 20% that is most important to that task, you will get 80% of the results. And you don't have to get the remaining 20%. It's, it's, in certain areas, it's not crucial. Now, in mixing, if you're mixing engineers, you need to get the 100%. 
it's it's a non-negotiable because if you're mixing, that is your product. That is the thing you're trying to uh, get out into the world. And if you settle for only the 80% in mixing, you're not going to have a sustainable career, unfortunately. But you're not a marketer. You are a, you're a studio owner. You're a mixing engineer. You don't have to understand marketing. So you only need the 20% in marketing. You only need the 20% in finance and budgeting and understanding money management. You only need the 20% in, in the business side of things because those are the areas that as long as you are not, it's not core to your service, it's not core to, your, to your, uh, what you're offering, you can get by on the 20%. And that's why I love the 80-20 principle. So in 2014, this is where I discovered the 80-20 principle. And this is when I was doing full service, tracking, editing, recording, mixing, mastering. I was doing everything. I was even lodging the bands in my studio. Uh, I'm here in Nashville, wow. Tennessee for anyone. That's who's pretty gonna, ballsy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was, I had bunk beds and stuff. It was, it was fun, but also draining. And I learned about the 80-20 principle and I, and I did a rundown of all my finances. And I realized that, um, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers because it's been a long time. It was, I guess, five years since I've done this, but I made about, $65,000 that year from recording and lodging and doing the full service for the bands that year. And that's where I spent the vast majority of my time, 40, 50 hours plus per week doing that. And I also did mixing projects where bands would just send me the tracks and I would mix those. And I would also master it because that's kind of the way it works in metal, but it's not always the same in other genres, but I would mix and master the songs. And then I would send them back to the artist. And this would be people over the world, Australia, Canada, uh, uh, Europe, and they never actually came to my studio. Well, this work was giving, it gave me about 40 something thousand dollars, but I was spending maybe 15 hours a week doing this work. And I realized if I could just simply cut back on the amount of tracking I was doing in the studio, recording, editing, all these things that were both draining mentally, but also taking up a lot of my time, if I could cut out that, that 80% of time wasting stuff that I was doing, and focus on that 20% of mixing that was bringing in a lot of money for me as, as far as my dollars per hour, then I could up my income. And when I started doing that, I was able to increase uh, my income from, I think I went from about $100,000 that year to like almost $200,000 a year after that. And I did no tracking at all. And my overall hours per week had dropped to about 30, 40 hours a week uh, in the studio. And that was through implementing the 80-20 principle in all these different areas. There's a lot more to that story. It's, it's like I'm trying to, I'm breezing over like 12 months yeah. of hard work and about mm -hmm. seven minutes of talking, but that's the gist of the 80-20 principle and how it affected my studio. So the, it, it applies in so many different ways um, from collaboration with your clients to your editing work, if you're doing any editing work, to emails back and forth, to... Um, I mean, you probably can think of better things uh, off the top of your head than I can because I, I just yeah no it's the I curse think, of knowledge I think it's, it's the curse of knowledge for me right now. The curse of knowledge is when you know something <laughs> so well that you no longer know how to teach it to somebody who doesn't know this. No, no, I understand. I understand. No, I think that it's really, really good principle because the point is again, I'm just going to kind of re say it, but 20% of the work you do brings in 80% of the fruits, right? So yes. what that means, it also means that 80% of the stuff that you do, you might want to cut out of your life. Like you might want to figure out, adjust that to kind of focus on what is actually doing you good. Now, from a mix standpoint, I can really like testify about this because when I'm mixing, like the first 30 minutes to an hour of mixing where I'm just building the framework, that's like, I'm like, that's done. Like to a certain degree, I'm done. After that, all that automation and everything else, like that, sure, I think that really helps and affects everything. But most of my work, the base of my mixes are done in like the first 30 minutes to an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And I, I believe you're kind of the same way, right? Yeah. So it's in, in mixing for me, I, I, this is another thing I did in my actual mixing process. I performed the 80, 20 principle, which was of all the tasks I do, what are the things that actually impact my mix? The thing that I'm being paid to do this, the overall sound. And I literally went through, I don't know if you've ever done this before, but I, I went step by step every single step in the process of mixing from start to finish. What do I do from, uh, getting the files from the client to uh, making sure I'm getting paid, to making sure uh, that, that the files are labeled correctly, to relabeling the files, you know, all the things, and then actually getting them into my DAW and then organizing and labeling the tracks or putting them into a mixing template, which I highly recommend using mixing templates if you don't, at least as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And then just every single step from A, B, C, all the way to Z. And I realized that 80% of it, surprise, was stuff that anybody could do that had basic knowledge of the DAW, uh, of DAW management and, and file management, all those things. I learned that 80% of it, someone else could do. And so I hired a mixed prep assistant 
who for 30 bucks an hour, he does all of my mix prep. And that means whenever I mix a project, all I have to do is open up the, the project. We have it synced to Dropbox folder that we share because I have a, like a Dropbox business account, which is great for collaboration like this. And the files are exactly the way he left them when he saved the fully prepped session. And all I do is I open it up and all I have to do is start tweaking it to my uh, heart's desire. All I'm doing is mixing at that point. I'm not doing all the other bullshit. Sorry, I don't know if I can cuss on this podcast. No, you're doing, good, you're good. <laughs> I'm not doing all the other bullshit that requires uh, me sitting there tediously renaming files and organizing things and importing it into a, a session and then realizing that they forgot to send the right, the right uh, bit depth and uh, they forgot to do all of the things that I asked them to do. And now I have to email them back and ask them to resend me the files. My assistant handles all of that. So all that's left for me to do is actually mix the thing I get paid to do. And so my time uh, to, to mix a 10 song album went from like 40 hours down to about 10 hours. I cut it into wow. a, a fourth of the time. And wow. my cost for that is maybe a th anywhere from 500 bucks to a thousand bucks an album for my assistant that I pay out to him. But that means I'm getting anywhere from five to six grand to mix a 10 song album. And my profit left over at the end of that is about five to 5,500 5, to 5,500 bucks. And my time commitment for that is anywhere from five, 10, 15 hours. So my dollars per hour has gone up significantly and my time on the project has gone down significantly, but the quality of the project has not suffered in any way, shape or form. And that is, that was a game changing thing in my business. And that's, what's allowed me to do things like, uh, build the six figure home studio, uh, the podcast, the blog, the courses I've made. I, I, I don't spend all of my time in the studio. Now I have extra time to build other businesses like file pass and, uh, and, and, and without systemizing the mixing portion and understanding that I only need to do the 20% of crucial work uh, to, that, that overall affects the, the end product. Um, and, and as long as my clients are happy with that, obviously the, the end product is the only thing that matters. Not all of the file management and the labeling and the importing into the session and the prep work and the, the minor automation, the standard automation stuff that my assistant can do. None of that matters. What matters is the overall end product. And if they're happy, then if that means I have 40 extra hours per week that I can, imp that I can put into other businesses and uh, other things that I do, I also invest in real estate. So that takes up a, a portion of my time as well. <laughs> uh, it allows me to do these other things so that I'm not tied down to one business, which is trading dollars for hours at the end of the day. Even if I'm making a lot of money in my mixing studio, it's still, I'm trading my time for money. And I would rather put this extra time that I have into scalable businesses that don't directly take my time in order to make money. Absolutely. And I think that is really, really smart. And again, it just comes back to the fact that you were creative in figuring out how to run a business, right? Um, again, we're really creative with the music stuff, but sometimes we need to be creative. I mean, you've probably found a way into the real estate and way into the file pass by meeting people. You know, you're creative about getting to that steps as well, those steps as well. And it's just so interesting because the 80-20 principle applies to almost anything that we do. Like in Brian's case, I believe that it's a little bit more, you have a lot more clients that you need to run through and you're a little bit more busy than the average person. Um, and then, so this was a way of getting more dollars per hour right for the next person it might be the same sort of effect it might be a dollars per hour increase but through something really small by just automating the way that you import and export files automating like maybe doing some sort of like response system for your email you know uh, whatever it is like using calendly you know or some some sort of calendar booking thing if you're a recording session like using acuity or calendly for your bookings like that alone like automating that side for my stuff when i was recording as well i no longer Longer record but when I was recording using acuity like that calendars website it is it increased my sales not only by about 60% but also my time spent trying to like back and forth on emails like went down just so much so I know that that was like a really really good and people are so scared to pay that $25 a month or whatever but then they don't realize that it's gonna make them more than $25 a month yeah there's there's um, something that I heard it's a quote I don't know who says it but I love it it is uh, Price is what you pay. Value is what you get out of that. And I think most people focus way too much on the price of something and they don't think even for a second about the value they get from that. So for Calendly or for Acuity or whatever scheduling app you use, the price is 10, 15, 20, 25 bucks a month. 
the value you get is the fact that you have just eliminated 20, 30, 40 emails per month from your workflow that you never have to do again playing calendar tag, trying to figure out, oh, uh, 2 p.m. Thursday doesn't work for me. Or my uh, my mixing dates between August 3rd and August 18th are full, so I can't do that. Can you do uh, start August 20th? And then they're like, no, I can't do August 20th because we're going out on a tour. We're not going to get back. <laughs> into And so this is like 30 emails back and forth or a 15-minute yeah. phone conversation. Instead, you pay 10, 15, 20 bucks a month for something like Calendly or Acuity. And that's eliminated. And this is not just, we're talking about a Calendly or Acuity. This is like any tool out there that helps save you time or effort or money or any, uh, it's the, again, focus on value, not the price. And one of the things of value that Brian has brought into this world, the commerce, the, the economy of music business, <laughs> how do we say, that is so valuable to what we do. Um, is a company called FilePass and a website called FilePass.com. And FilePass is an awesome website where just like Dropbox or like Google, uh, Google Drive where you can upload files, um, but not only do they upload and store to a cloud as a stayed in their uncompressed format, and clients can listen to them, but they you can actually restrict them from downloading the file unless they've paid for it. I mean, yep. that is such an incredible opening to the market that I can't even like I can't even believe. I mean, I talked about the last episode, like one good idea, which wasn't even possible before, but now it might be possible. I mean, I kind of like, I know your your partner, Chris Graham on the Six Figure Home Studio podcast, he does a thing where he does demo demo masters. Mm -hmm. And he, he masters a song for you for free, but you can't download it without the voice tag um, unless you pay his price, which is ridiculously cheap. I think it's like 50 bucks and he does a great job. I've actually hired Chris a couple times. Um, and so now with the mixes, Using file pass, this opens up a whole new market of where we can actually offer demo mixes to clients if you're willing and able to, um, if you want to find new clientele. And they they can't download it. They can ask for revisions on certain time stamped parts of the song, but they can't download the song unless they're willing to pay for it. So you're giving them the service. You're giving them an opportunity to hear how good you are at your mix and kind of prove yourself, but without the risk of them just walking away with a free product. Yeah, so FilePass came out of my own needs as a mixing engineer, and I wish I would have had it when I was still a recording engineer too. But the the collaboration process when it comes to revisions is has always been a nightmare for me. And mm. I, I don't know how many nightmare clients you've gotten, but they have like this long block of text in an email. And, and that's the good ones. They have this long block of text in an email. The bad ones have like, they'll send you a text message from every single member with their specific tedious requests. And then uh. <laughs> one, like the drummer will send them on Facebook. And then somehow the, the guitarist will find you on Tinder or Bumble and they'll send their mix revisions through there. And then, so you, <laughs> that's a joke. Oh, on the last one. So <laughs> no, basically you, you have all these different areas. People are sending you uh, revision requests on a song. And so what file pass sets out to do is to, to consolidate all that into one central area. So we're not directly competing with Dropbox. I still use Dropbox. I still love Dropbox. Dropbox is great for uh, like team collaboration. Like my, my mix prep assistant, we work out of a Dropbox thing. My podcast editor, he works out of a Dropbox uh, uh, folder that we sync together on our computers. So it's like updated real time. It's like great for that stuff. But where Dropbox falls flat is when it comes to actually collaborating with clients that you're working with, like a freelance gig, which is most mixing engineers like me. So when I send a file to a client for feedback, I don't use Dropbox. A, they degrade the file quality to where it sounds like a, 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 a just a turd. That's the only word I can think of. It sounds like a turd. <laughs> they degrade the audio quality, so my mixes sound terrible. And second of all, uh, I get, uh, like I said, a long, at the good ones will send me a long list of revisions in an email. At least it's in one place, an email. And then I have to go through and match up the timestamps, if they even give me timestamps, mm -hmm. to the song. And then I have to like, somehow remember if I did that revision or not. And if I have questions about a revision they asked for that I just don't understand, I have to like save that one. And then like later on reply to that specific message, uh, that specific revision in a message in a reply. And so it's just, it's a nightmare for, for has been a nightmare for me in the past. And so FilePass solves that because I can send uh, a client a project through FilePass and all of the project is in one nice and neat place and they can stream the full wave file or high quality MP3 or whatever you upload, we don't do any encoding. Whatever you upload is exactly what they stream. And they can uh, do this all on their browser or on their phone 
whatever device has internet connection and they can't actually download the track unless I allow them to. I have, I can turn downloads on and off and I can put it behind a paywall. So if they still owe me money, they can only stream, they can only leave timestamp provisions. Like they can put a pin right at three minutes and 33 seconds that right here, we need to uh, remove this vocal delay because it's covering up the guitar lead that comes in after this. Those types of things are so much easier because the timestamps are dropped directly on the track. I don't have to go hunt it down now. And then they can actually pay through FilePass. We've integrated with Stripe, which is a payment platform. It's awesome. We're actually working with a uh, working for a working with PayPal to integrate with PayPal as well, so that people can pay through credit card or PayPal. Right now, it's only credit card. And when they do that, the money goes directly to your account. We don't touch it. Uh, we don't take anything from it. And uh, it unlocks the file or the full project. So if there's multiple files in that project, it unlocks the project where they can actually download the files. And so typically, what I'll do for the listeners who are unfamiliar with FilePass, I'll just usually have uh, downloads disabled and we'll collaborate and we'll make everything happy and we'll do multiple versions. And when they're finally happy, I'll upload a zip file to FilePass. I will turn on the paywall and then they will pay and download the zip file with all their final files in it. And you talked about uh, test mixes or test masters. This is perfect for that as well. If you want to test master a song or test mix a song, send it to them on FilePass, put a paywall up. And if they don't like it, they don't have to pay for it. If they like it, they pay for it and download it. And you're basically done. Yeah. I, I mean, that's just so incredible. I mean, for me, it's a no brainer. Like, why would I not pay for that? And, and the thing is actually right now, I believe you're still in beta testing period. I don't want to misspeak. No, well, but... it's, it's, we're basically, we're basically done with, well, we actually, we've technically been out of beta. We've been in early access for the past few months. Uh, but, uh, I will be happy to put a link up for your listeners if they want to join this. Uh, just oh, to, yeah, you know, absolutely. Just go to, to filepass.com. We want to give a link here or what? I can give a link. Yeah, I could put a link here and then as well as in the description. Sure, yeah. So there'll be a link in the description and I'll just tell you here, filepass.com slash mixing. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> slash mixing. Great. And uh, can you tell us about the new pricing plans? Yeah, so we launched new pricing on Monday and we have uh, three different tiers depending on if you are kind of like a part-time or hobbyist started getting started, uh, whether you're part-time or whether you're a full-time studio. And the prices are as low as eight bucks a month. And the highest plan is 29 bucks, bucks a month uh, if you pay annually. And then it's like, it's a little more than that if you pay it by month. And so if you just go to uh, filepass.com slash mixing, uh, it'll have all the info on how you can get started with uh, FilePass on there. Wow, that is incredible. And again, like such a useful product. Like I think that everybody listening right now should at least go to YouTube and like check out Brian explaining FilePass and how it works. Um, and just go into the website, filepass.com backslash mixing um, and check it out. Like it might not be for you, but... 99% chance that it will be just exactly right for you. <laughs> Especially if you are an engineer of any kind giving products to clients. If you just go to filepass.com, there's a video on there and some like handy little uh, GIFs or GIFs, depending on how you say it. The proper way is GIFs, but I'm not going to get into that argument right now. <laughs> if there's some GIFs on the page that uh, show you how it works and uh, you can kind of get a good overview if you just go to filepass.com. If you want to join it without uh, having to wait on the list, you can just go to filepass.com slash mixing. That's the, the unique link for this podcast uh, for the listeners. Perfect. Thank you so much. And never again will we ever have to have a client run away with our product without having them pay. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the goal. Well, thank you so much for listening to Mixing Music. Thank you so much to Brian Hood from Six Figure Home Studio and File Pass and 456 Recordings. I don't know if you still use that name. I do. But uh, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. You've been listening to Mixing Music. Please leave a five-star review if you like what you're hearing. That is one of the best and easiest ways and a free way to support the podcast and help us keep going and getting let me, more. Let me, butt in. let me butt in on your outro that I know you probably yeah. do every episode. Uh the, the, the reviews are very important because uh, you had a lot of reviews on this podcast, which makes it shows me that you are a serious podcast. So when it comes to getting guests on the podcast, the more reviews you have, the easier it is to land those guests. So it is important for your listeners to leave reviews if they want more guests on this podcast. You heard it. You heard it from Brian Hood himself. Thank you so much. Stay saucy. One, two, three. Yeah. This episode of Mixing Music with DK has been brought to you by LaunchPod Media. If you want to start a podcast, make sure to start it right with LaunchPod Media.